Okay. I wanted to start off by saying uh, what a great pleasure it's been to co-organize and, and now attend this workshop on knowledge-guided machine learning. Uh, as a Packard fellow, I used to attend annual meetings where we would hear these terrific talks from all areas of science and engineering, chemistry, physics, astronomy, mathematics. Uh, and it drove home to me the point that uh, I most enjoy conferences and symposia that bring together diverse fields, like what we've been witnessing over these past few days. Uh, it also taught me uh, that I needed to and how to raise my game when speaking to diverse audiences. And so if there are any hydrologists, climatologists, or any aquatic scientists still left on the call, I think that there were a couple last I looked on the participant list, this talks for you. I'm gonna introduce one project in translational biology uh, from my group, which ends where I think that knowledge-guided machine learning uh, could pick up. Um, I'm going to intentionally tread lightly on the details because I personally find that big acronym soup to be somewhat uh, off-putting. Uh, and this publication here on the bottom uh, gives you, provides all the experiments, analyses, and mathematical details. All right, my focus today is on oxidative stress uh, and its precursor reactive oxygen species. And uh, I'll begin with what these teams terms mean chemically and biologically. Uh, reactive oxygen species arise when oxygen reacts with an unpaired electron to form a highly reactive molecule called superoxide. This is what bleaches a fluorescent molecule if you stare at it for too long. And, and a downstream derivative of it, hydrogen peroxide, is a component of all those hand sanitizers that we're using by the hour. Why are reactive oxygen species antimicrobial? Well, it's because they react uh, rapidly with all shapes and sizes of biomolecules. And these chemical modifications are often detrimental to the organism. And more on that to come in a moment. Uh, but before I get there, I want to tell you where these free electrons and by extension reactive oxygen species come from within cells. And the answer is mitochondria. So it's a subcellular structure that powers all nucleated cells through what's called an electron transport chain. Hopefully you see where this is headed. Um, the electron transport chain itself is quite good, but the initial transfer of electrons from the rest of the cell to the mitochondria is leaky or lossy, meaning that mitochondria occasionally fumble the handoff of an electron uh, from the cell and allow it to escape, react with ambient oxygen and create superoxide. Mitochondria get even clumsier when instead of being fused together uh, as a contiguous network, think a lava lamp analogy, uh, they're broken up into little pieces through a process called fission. Uh, and this fission is required when cells divide. Since cancer is characterized by un uncontrolled cell division and proliferation, oxidative stress is important for the disease. However, its precise role is extremely complicated. On the one hand, superoxide can directly damage DNA, give rise to mutations, thus the motivation for consuming antioxidants in dark colored vegetables, or for some, taking the highly concentrated pills available on the nutraceutical shelf of the grocery store. However, reactive oxygen species also disrupt other biomolecules that uh, if that damage is in excess, uh, uh, would be detrimental both to microbes, to cells, and even to cancer cells. Thus, one could argue that reactive oxygen species serve a tumor suppressive role. And there's evidence for uh, antioxidants waking up tumors that would otherwise be dormant in the face of excess oxidative stress. Unsurprisingly, our cells have evolved elaborate mechanisms for sustaining life in the face of oxidative stress. From the standpoint of detoxification, our cells express a suite of enzymes that take reactive oxygen species and convert them to progressively less reactive products, culminating in the formation of water. More interesting, to me at least, is that reactive oxygen species also serve a signaling function acting as second messengers that turn off families of enzymes, which normally keep signaling pathways inactive. Inhibiting an inhibitor is equivalent to activation. Of note for this talk are the ubiquitin ligases, which tag specific proteins for destruction within the cell. If these ligases are inhibited, 
the targeted protein accumulates and then can go on and exert its function. We were examining two such proteins, which uh, serve as transcription factors regulating the expression of several of these detoxifying enzymes, along with a number of other uh, important cell stress effectors. NERF2 uh, is a transcription factor stabilized by oxidative stress, as well as uh, electrophiles derived from broccoli sprouts, and has a two-phase role in cancer with moderate activity thought to uh, suppress cancer, but chronic stabilization thought to promote it. P53 is another transcription factor, but it by contrast is nicknamed the guardian of the genome and is uh, the most commonly mutated gene in human cancers. When we stand for the accumulation of these two proteins in non-cancerous breast epithelial cells shown in the lower left here, we observed a sporadic stabilization that often, but not always, coincided in the same cells. To orient you, the scale bar here is 20 microns, and the images that you're looking at are cross-section, multicolor images of maybe two dozen cells. We quantified the NERF2 P53 co-stabilization across hundreds of cells uh, and analyzed their relationship by mutual information, which asked, which asked, given the stabilization of one protein, how much does that reduce uncertainty about whether the other will be stabilized? And what we found was a significant statistical coupling, non-zero mutual information uh, between these two proteins. Why would these two proteins be stabilized in the first place? Well, we were observing them expand in a three-dimensional culture format that requires a good bit of cell proliferation and reorganization under conditions that generate a lot of stress. So much so that some of the cells in these 3D cultured spheres die because of the excess oxidative stress. At this point, the translational biologist should be asking who cares about a pattern that arises from what is possibly a cell culture artifact. But uh, what I can tell you is that the pattern is disrupted uh, when we perturb these cells genetically. And we find that 3D growth and organization is altered in non-obvious ways when we do this disruption of these transcription factors and disruption of the pattern. We also observe similar patterns in the mammary glands of mice during puberty as well as in normal breast tissue from women, shown in the upper panels here. Interestingly, we found that the coupling was statistically elevated in breast premalignancies, these so-called ductal carcinoma in situs, or DCIS uh, lesions, both in clinical material, as shown on the right here. This is a DCIS lesion with the margin I'm highlighting with the pointer as well as in cultures of DCIS-like cell lines. Recall that the mutual information in the former slide was about half that shown here. Strikingly, in breast cancer, this coupling breaks down entirely. Had multiple instances of single positive cells found in the tumors. So something here is engaged, activated during premalignancy, and then blown up during the course of the disease. To organize our observations and evaluate their consistency with known mechanisms, we turn to systems modeling of the established physical chemistry. In the opening session, Marcus said Reichstein flashed a couple of examples of systems modeling in the geosciences. And I wanna emphasize the distinction here for good systems biology. And the schema on the left hand side here, there's not an influence map of dependencies that have been documented or postulated. It's as close to fact as biologists can achieve. In other words, I know that if I take purified keep one and mix it together with hydrogen peroxide, that um, it will be directly oxidized, keep one by the hydrogen peroxide or its downstream products. Furthermore, if I take this oxidized keep one and mix it together with NERF2 under the right conditions, it will no longer be able to act as a ubiquitin ligase that degrades NERF2. And for the math aficionados, I'll say that uh, these models are not much more than mass action kinetics, coded as a system of delay differential equations with rate parameters estimated either from time scales of the biology uh, or from direct biochemical measurements done in the lab. 
Before this work, we had good physical chemical models for the NERF2 and P53 pathways citations here in magenta and green, but no one had previously found a reason to join the two together, which is what we did by carefully considering, and for the most part, excluding instances of crosstalk between the two modules. We then use the integrated model to simulate our experiments. In the NERF2 P53 stabilizations observed, if they came from bursts of oxidative stress, and those bursts came from mitochondrial fragmentation as a result of cell division or other triggers in the culture or in the tissues, then we would expect these bursts to arrive randomly and asynchronously such that any fixed snapshot of a culture or a tumor or a tissue would reflect the cells adapting at different times to the oxidative perturbation. Using the model, it was straightforward to parallelize our simulations and gather random snapshots at random uh, bursts of oxidative stress, and then evaluate things like mutual information that resulted from those simulations. When we did this, we observed relatively good concordance with the statistical couplings documented in the 3D cultures, including a doubling of the mutual information observed going from a non-cancerous breast epithelial line to a pre-malignant pre DCIS-like cell line. Overall, the relationships are a lot stronger, but that's because the model is devoid of any statistical blur caused by experimental noise, which is considerable for the experiments that we were doing. As importantly, the model could make predictions about synergistic changes in overall time integrated oxidative stress when one factor, NERF2 or P53 or the other, was perturbed genetically or pharmacologically. And these likewise agreed with the emergence of phenotypes, not showing here, uh, that were observed when NERF2 or P53 were jointly disrupted in experiments. We sought to leverage these capabilities uh, in the realm now of data, uh, cancer data science. One of the advantages of working with cell lines is that all the information is out there in the public domain these days. Accessing genetic data on hundreds of lines through the cancer cell line encyclopedia is straightforward. We uh, extracted 15 breast cancer transcriptomes. That's all that acronym soup I'm on the top here. That describe the abundance of 20,000 or so genes expressed by these cells and mined out the 15 species that were direct surrogates in the model. Another set of acronyms over on the right here. Then we used these line to line variations in the abundance to define different initial conditions for the model which were then iterated uh, as before to calculate things such as mutual information and overall oxidative stress handling. And what we found was that the cancer cells with high oxidative stress tolerance, this is reactive oxygen species, coincided with high mutual information, a high statistical coupling between um, NERF2 and P53. Among these cells, when we genetically perturbed the NERF2 pathway, we actually didn't see much of, it, uh, of an, a phenotype or an effect when we grew them in 3D. Conversely, on the other end of the spectrum over here, there were lines with low tolerance, low mutual information, and growth phenotypes when we blocked NRF2 signaling genetically. The rub was that the phenotypes were not all in the same direction. Some lines grew worse, other lines grew better with NERF2 pathway disruption. And there would be opportunities for machine learning to, dis, uh, to discriminate between these two groups if we could dramatically increase the number of lines that we perform this analysis with, perhaps by subcloning out uh, different derivatives of these lines that are shown on the top. Where it got really confusing was when we pivoted to using the exact same approach with transcriptomic information, not from breast cancer cell lines, but instead from clinical breast cancer cases from the Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCGA. On the left, this was a slide from before, compressed version on the left-hand panel here uh, in H, are the expression profiles for the lines. Uh, and what is clear is that the breast tumors are very different in their gene expression profiles. Same genes here along on the rows. 
some genes are expressed at entirely different abundances from what was observed in the culture. As an example, MBM2 here on the top row. Whereas other genes are much more spread about the average culture abundance. Like a good example of that are these detoxifying enzymes shown in the three rows here. Further, when we ran the simulations, the nice relationship between oxidative stress tolerance and NERF 2 P53 mutual information broke down, including several notable cases of low tolerance, but extremely high coupling between P53 and NERF 2. They're highlighted by the tick marks there in the middle. In these cases, perturbations of NERF 2 envision the woman who dutifully takes her concentrated broccoli sprout supplement. Um, could have a dramatic impact on tumor growth. We just don't know right now which direction that impact will be. Will it be a positive or a negative impact? And so in, in closing, I want to conclude with where I think uh, knowledge-guided machine learning could help us in the next steps of the puzzle. Uh, to review, what we have is a physical chemical model that takes in gene abundances, passes them through a, a biochemical network and makes predictions about stress coupling and handling. Moreover, what I can tell you uh, is that straightforward regression uh, of genes to predictions fares terribly. So that there's something in the model that the model is doing beyond a straight mapping of abundances to incremental changes in prediction. But we can't figure out what that is. Perhaps some type of neural network architecture probably with a relatively small number of nodes and his hidden layers could be useful to us if the inputs and outputs are constrained by the topology of the network. For example, negative feedbacks would be a constrained instance of backpropagation. In this way, the oxidative stress dynamics act like a convolution of sorts, kernel, relating the things that we can measure to the things that we care about with the machine learning providing insight into how the model got there. The advantage uh, with this type of formalism is that we can simulate as much synthetic data as needed in the range of abundances documented uh, for human breast cancers to guide the learning. Uh, at this point, it's just an idea, but it's one that was really nucleated uh, as being part of this HDR group that you've been hearing about over the past several days. And uh, I'll conclude with my acknowledgements. This work was uh, led by a recent PhD graduate from my group, uh, Liz Pereira, who uh, really regrets not being able to present this work to you herself. Uh, she was aided uh, by uh, multiple undergrads, graduate students, and research associates uh, in the group at specific facets of the project. The experimental work was supported by the, uh, uh, the National Institute of Health, as grant number shown here. And a lot of the computation was uh, conceptualized and driven forward as a result of the um, HDR uh, support. And so with that, I will thank you and take any questions from the audience. Hi, Kevin. Uh, just uh, one question. You mentioned uh, how the machine learning will help in the future work. And also, I, I'd like to know a little bit detail what kind of uh, prior knowledge really will help in your research. Okay, and so the, the, the first one was, um, yeah, so I, I got hung up on the second one and so I didn't quite hear the first one. Could you repeat it again? The first part of the question. Oh, I, I just hope uh, to, you know, I saw you, uh, you slides for the future work and mm -hmm. machine learning. So how the uh, prior knowledge uh, what kind of prior knowledge will help? Oh, yes. Well, I, I think that the, this topology, so the connections here, if, we, if, if there's a, a neural network type of architecture that is constrained, some of the edges don't have absolute flexibility to be gained and lost and amplified or decreased. If there's a rigid structure at certain places, but then a machine learning type of flexibility to weight edges elsewhere in places where we wanna have non-linearities and we wanna have things be emphasized and be emphasized. For us, I think that would be very valuable because we can still look at those weightings through this prior knowledge 
about which factors interact with which other factor. And in the models, in these simulations, we keep track of all of these species and we can measure them over time, the dynamics. Now our end readout here are the integrated results of many time dependent simulations. So it's not as straightforward as a, a time series and we want to auto encode and go things from, uh, from, from there. Uh, but it does provide us access to a rich source of observations to look at how the, those things should be weighted. But I think having a little bit of rigidity by the biological knowledge, it would be beneficial for us for interpret, interpretability because we really want to look at the weighting through the pathways that we have this understanding about. Okay, thank you.